today. So it's wonderful to have her with us. And without further ado, I shall hand over to her. Camilla, the stage is yours. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for this very kind introduction. And thank you all for being here and being interested. It's very, very nice to see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have to send, send some apologies already because of my voice, because it might uh, fail at moments. Um, but um, we'll see how we get through this. <laughs> um, okay, and here comes the, now we're all in the way of putting this on the big screen. So, yeah. It's happening? Yes. Now I have to put you out of the way of my own presentation again. Yep. There we are. All right, so this is me. Um, so what I'm speaking about today in this seminar is going to be um, basically what I find a competing terms for, for complementary concepts at times, um, <clears throat> issues of acceptance, legitimacy, and the role of trust for regional energy transitions. Um, so I'm just going to kind of do a quick introduction of my own, um, even though Brownie has already said most of uh, what is interesting. Uh, and then I'm just going to speak about RENEA, which is this uh, project that I've been involved uh, in for the last few years at the University of Oldenburg, Regional Energy Transitions. Uh, and then speak about this kind of dichotomy, potential dichotomy between acceptance and legitimacy and uh, potential role for trust. Uh, and then look at potential case studies uh, for this work that I'm doing uh, and <clears throat> offer some early observations from the case study and reflect on that and conclude. I should say uh, that I'm inviting you on a little, uh, very explorative, very early journey. Um, I'm going to refer to some work that we have done already. And of course, we've done all the case studies in the different regions. Um, but what I am showing you today is very, very early stages work. Uh, of actually two paper projects that I'm involved in. So this is me, um, Camilla Klebner. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oldenburg. And as you just mentioned, I, it took me a long time to, to actually define this kind of identity for myself. But I now tell everyone that I am an economic geographer with interest in the intersections uh, with uh, innovation research and transition studies. And I think I've, I'm relatively well settled on that by now. Uh, it's this interdisciplinarity. I guess some of you would resonate with that when you hear that. That makes it sometimes a bit difficult to say who you really are. <laughs> um, and my key research interest, I would say, is in the uh, des fate and destiny of regions as they go sustainable development. That's kind of the focus uh, of what I have been doing and what I want to do going forward. So. What's the sort of wider relevance of um, this uh, regional energy transitions? I'd just like to set the scene a little bit and look at, um, just to give you a bit of context, energy transition in Germany. Of course, it's a relatively well studied field. Uh, it's also a relatively advanced uh, energy transition, uh, as Germany has, of course, been a trailblazer in this, uh, this field. Uh, so that means that technologies involved are considered rather, rather mature. Um, this concerns mainly uh, onshore wind, but also solar PV, uh, but also increasingly recently also um, offshore wind and biogas technologies. Um, in Germany, the energy transition actually took uh, the, the origin in, in more smaller disconnected activities in, in the north of Germany. Um, but it also, and it also had a very significant impulse from uh, a very strong anti-nuclear sentiment. This is something that I dealt with in my own dissertation at Oxford Brooks, if you're interested. Uh, I then compared uh, Germany and Britain and the development of the wind energy industry in the two countries. So what happened was that also very rather well-connected individuals influenced national policy directly. Um, some of them also from the regions that we looked at in the project. And a fixed tariff support mechanism was introduced in, the, in 1990 and then kind of improved and upgraded in 2000. And that really led to a renewable energy boom in the early 2000s in, in Germany. Um, of course, over time, the, the, and some would say uh, because of this uh, fixed tariff support mechanism, but you can discuss that, uh, but over time, uh, the PV power production was basically overtaken by Chinese producers, but you could 
I would still say that onshore turbine manufacturers to this day still keep a rather strong hold on, on the market uh, in turbines. Um, of course, transition dynamics across the country and in general, but also across Germany are very heterogeneous. Uh, and it seems that the capacity for accepting technology, the legitimacy, the legitimacy of technology, and also matters of socio institutional trust um, do play an important role in that context. So why look at a, a region? Why look? Why take this kind of regional perspective? Um, I think it's quite well understood now that the transformation of systems of uh, production and consumption is necessary, but it's also very complex. And um, I mean, until a few years ago, we always said it's not very well understood beyond the technological requirements. That's probably a little bit outdated, I would say, especially the field uh, of transition studies is very much um, kind of pushed into that uh, and shifted that a bit. Um, in general, regions, um, relatively small scale regions are often at the forefront of transition processes. They are the place where um, renewable energy technology is uh, installed. Um, so conflicts arise right there, these locations, but then of course regions are not isolated. Um, they're they are linked uh, with other territories, they, they are linked uh, across scales, and there's also temporal sensitivity. So what we um, suggest taking or what we usually take in our work is a relational perspective. And of course, being an interdisciplinary researcher, I have to say this, but uh, it's rather clear that single disciplinary perspectives are not really sufficient to really understand or get a realistic grasp of uh, the various dynamics that are involved in these processes. Um, so the project that I've been involved with at the University of Oldenburg is called Renia Regional Energy Transitions. It's an interdisciplinary project. I've been alluding to that. There's uh, three researchers and one PI, as Professor Janika Mattes um, in the <clears throat> Department for Organization and Innovation. Um, the, we bring together in our research group uh, the fields of sociology of innovation, economic geography, political sciences and sustainability economics. The project has been funded by the German Research Foundation since 2018 and is going to run until mid next year. To make this kind of manageable, um, it's been agreed uh, to, uh, to focus mainly uh, on the wind energy sector. Uh, and the key idea is to, to grasp energy transitions as a social process rather than um, a technological transition. Uh, so what we did was we did six uh, in-depth qualitative case studies, one in Oldenburg, where the university is based, uh, one in Hamburg, one in Northern Frisia, one in Uckermark, uh, just northeast of uh, Berlin, uh, one in Magdeburg and surroundings, and then one in Kassel and surroundings. So this kind of um, tension, maybe, or this field of legit uh, acceptance, legitimacy, and trust. Um, I would just like to show you how I think in my own work and that together with my colleagues, I am currently exploring that and just kind of introduce to you a few lines of argument uh, that we're bringing together at the moment. So this on the on the left, the, my left, probably your left as well. Yeah, um, the this uh, figure on acceptance um, is a rather well known kind of framework on acceptance by Rüstenhagen and colleagues, uh, where they differentiate between a socio political acceptance or more kind of acceptance on a more general societal level, community acceptance, so uh, acceptance by those affected by technology. Uh, and then market acceptance uh, between consumers and investors, so kind of more economic actors. Uh, it's commonly defined as a favorable or positive response um, relating to a proposed or in situ technology or socio technical systems uh, by members of a given social unit. So it's quite, uh, the focus tends to be on the accepting party or accepting individuals and their characteristics. And about it's all about the measurement of the levels of acceptance very often uh, and also drivers that influence that. Uh, so it tends to be rather passive. Um, in, uh, and then in that differentiated from this idea of support. 
Um, and there's often a tendency for a kind of normative connotation. So uh, the idea that something has to be accepted and um, whether that is the case is not really in the discussion. Uh, legitimacy, however, is kind of a similar, at first sight, is a rather similar concept. Um, and I will say something about that a bit later. I uh, brought you along uh, a framework of our own, which I, which I think uh, illustrates rather well the definition uh, that I've brought along, which is uh, legitimacy as the alignment uh, between a technology and its innovation system. Uh, with the institutional environment. So how well does it fit into the institutional environment in a territorial unit? Apologies. Um, <clears throat> the, the figure I think illustrates that quite well because you see here you have this kind of technological innovation uh, with technology uh, and the legitimacy uh, as part of this yeah, uh, alignment uh, with those uh, institutional surroundings in the place or region. Um, it's understood to be a, a key function of uh, systems in the field of technological innovation systems. And that's also what we, had, we have drawn on here in this paper. Um, and it's understood as a more dynamic concept, um, focusing more on the interactions between stakeholders and also institutional structures. All right, so um, so what about this, how do they relate to each other or how do, how do they belong or is, there, is, is it different or, yeah, what about acceptance and legitimacy? Um, my colleagues and I, basically uh, Sebastian Rohe, my colleague from our group, uh, has identified uh, that there seems to be uh, no real kind of uh, overview over the existing literature. So what we have uh, set out to do, this is a colleague from, from uh, there, from uh, Fraunhofer Institute uh, and then another colleague of ours. Um, what we have set out to do is to, to do a, an in-depth investigation of how these concepts are actually treated in the, in the literature and what key differences might be. So some of the frameworks actually relate um, <clears throat> both concepts uh, and that also kind of creates overlaps between the bodies of literature of course. Uh, oftentimes they will be um, seen as different parts of a spectrum or pyramid like in this very example for example. So we have this kind of quote here, legitimacy is needed for project acceptance but then credibility uh, and trust are necessary for approval and then actually on a higher level trust um, then le also leads to identification with the project. That's a rather limit, uh, linear idea of how to line them up uh, and I wouldn't necessarily agree with it. You will see in a moment that I might maybe see it a bit different. Um, so it seems in the literature they often actually use just um, they're actually often just used interchangeably. So, so the way that it's kind of differentiated here is, is not so common. Uh, and also they just have very different starting points and, and, and different focus. But this is what we're trying to dive into, dig into uh, in this literature review. So this is kind of the first project that I brought along today. Um, <clears throat> this is just to give you uh, a little overview of uh, what it looks like. Uh, this is basically one of our working boards where we're just analyzing the different papers. And uh, what has happened is we looked at, so one of the things that we look at in this uh, literature review is um, what are influencing factors uh, on acceptance or legitimacy in the different papers that we look at. So what factors are identified that influence um, these concepts, what is uh, influence acceptance uh, and legitimacy respectively. Um, <clears throat> so we just collected them. And then uh, the color of the post-it uh, represents whether it's more out of the acceptance literature or out of the legitimacy literature. Um, so, yeah, and then, so we collected those and put them, collected them under different themes and then collected them, these under different themes as well. So they, they're kind of um, sorted uh, <clears throat> according to a different analysis level. And what is quite obvious is that that the word trust keeps appearing uh, when you look at these. Um, but so there's kind of trust is everywhere. Um, 
and it's, it doesn't have a clear position in this. So I, <clears throat> as part of this, but also before that, I'm going to have to drink water. <clears throat> but also before that already um, developed this interest in uh, what is actually the role of trust uh, as part of energy transitions. And I think it could be quite informative and instructive to actually better understand um, how trust influences uh, how we act and how that in turn uh, affects uh, energy transitions. So what could be the relevance of trust uh, for regional energy transitions? Um, I think my starting point, my own personal starting point is that uh, regional transitions, regional sustainability transitions are actually always a matter of human to human interactions. Um, <clears throat> both when we make individual decisions, but also when we make collective decisions, those probably especially that always depends on relationships. Um, so any incoming technolo technology, but also business models will uh, somewhat depend on a favorable representation by those uh, who represent it uh, regionally. Um, and that kind of links to how embedded, uh, for example, a firm might be in a region. There's a paper by my colleagues actually forthcoming on that issue, if that interests you. So I'm kind of thinking that maybe trust could be seen as a kind of facilitator of these negotiations, these nego negotiation processes as they happen over regional transitions. So of course there's inherent tensions and frictions uh, <clears throat> as part of um, transitions. Um, and if those kind of get out of hand, uh, they can also lead to the disengagement of actors in regions um, and a kind of trust building process or trust as, as part of the transition, um, the conscious trust building process could maybe alleviate that. Yeah. So what we see from the literature, um, I've kind of looked into both uh, German sociology literature on trust, but also um, some of the international uh, literature on trust. Uh, a very common distinction is that there's pre-existing kind of trust, but also trust, uh, a gradual trust, which is uh, can be created and lost. Um, and it seems to me, if we better understand this in, uh, in relation to energy transitions, that could actually be, as I said, instructive and assisting to, to both policymakers and firms that want to go into territory where they haven't been before, um, <clears throat> as they steer and shape those transition processes in regions. And uh, there's also the small fact that <laughs> trust has gained a bit of traction amongst the economic geography recent, uh, recently. So how might I maybe see a framework? This is extremely, extremely early stages um, and it's definitely not going to be the final framework, but um, I just thought I'd kind of illustrate uh, my thoughts a bit. Uh, it always helps in these presentations and you can then go and criticize it for, the, for all the good reasons. Um, I would say that acceptance kind of sits at the core, right? So this is the, because this is the individual side, so there's, but there's a kind of receptor perspective. Um, so just looking at uh, in, individual, individual individuals, um, but people, um, they don't really have much agency though, and interaction doesn't play an awful lot of uh, role, uh, and it's commonly approached in a sort of more psychological uh, perspective. And as I said, the focus is on individuals. And then you have this legitimacy, which kind of goes a bit further. Um, so it takes a more socio-technical perspective and also more interest in the more complex, uh, complex dynamic relationships between technology and stakeholders. Then you have trust. And trust is more kind of, or could be considered more on a societal level, so more pervasive actually. And as I mentioned, maybe as a facilitator of negotiation or what transition processes in different territories. The errors that go back um, are attempts to uh, illustrate this kind of pervasiveness that I'm trying to say. Maybe in a similar way that is it Foucault that says, power is in all relationships and maybe in a similar way that trust also could play um, a role in all relationships. 
So what would be potential research questions and, and theses that I would, um, initial theses that I would put out there maybe. So what can be the role of societal trust for, for regional transitions? Um, so I would say trust ensures that the conflicts and tensions that are inherent to, to sustainability transitions or energy transitions uh, don't stall or even stop the overall process. What different kinds of trust are relevant to regional transitions and how do they matter? So I would say that both initial and gradual trust uh, actually matter, but probably in different ways. It, this would be interesting to explore. And who knows if I dig deeper into the data, I might even find further uh, kinds of trust. In what way is trust actually dynamic? Um, well, trust can be gained, but it can also be lost. So that can be an interesting aspect. Of course, the reasons for that or the ways in which it can be gained and lost will be interesting. What makes different entities, such as, for example, individuals, organizations, or institutions actually trustworthy? Well, that is to be found out if I dig uh, as deep as I can into the empirical case studies. And I want to show you a little bit of the empirics um, going forward. This picture you may have seen in the advertising um, two months ago. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, what he shows is a, a trucker event. It's a trucker cinema. Um, so they uh, used the electricity to, from their uh, wind energy plant uh, to feed into the screen uh, uh, and did a kind of trucker cinema as a as a not trust building exercise, but uh, uh, to just kind of involve the local population a bit more. Um, just to give you an idea of what the state of play is in our project, um, we have uh, at the moment 171 qualitative expert interviews, and that's about um, 20 to 30 in every region. Some are also on this land level, so federal system, uh, land level and uh, national level, and they all took about one hour each. We also went into the regions uh, and observed meetings and discussions locally. Uh, and recently we've been doing um, follow-up interviews and that's about three to five interviews, a handful of interviews in it, every region. And that's usually roughly two years later. Um, <clears throat> so what we expect to have as a final body of, of data is about 200 interviews in total. So then, then there's also a final workshop this September where we kind of um, invited a few people to discuss uh, some of our results. Um, what we've been doing for all of the interviews is a qualitative content analysis. And then, uh, so there was a, a common coding scheme for all of the interviews, but then we also adjusted for, for uh, particular projects as they came along. And we also sometimes use different methods um, to complement uh, our existing qualitative work. So just to get a kind of sense of the relevance of this issue of trust, uh, whether it's actually a theme or not, um, I, <clears throat> I looked into, I built this one Max Curia file with all the, um, with all the regions in it and all the interviews from all the regions. Um, and to kind of get a sense of this issue, uh, I did this lexical search for Vertrauen, so Vertrau, and then a um, little asterisk, um, which is the word for trust um, in German. So all the interviews were in German. Um, and then in, uh, by way of uh, automatic coding included the whole paragraph, uh, paragraph where this word was actually, was actually coming up. Of course, you can now say um, that means all the times when trust was actually spoken about, but not actually said, um, are excluded. That is true. Um, and I haven't got a perfect excuse for that, but it's mainly about getting an overview at the stage. Uh, and at a later stage, I will probably have to do a few checks at least uh, to see whether there's many occasions where um, the word Vertrauen is not actually mentioned, uh, but still um, trust is an issue. So what comes out of this is, is quite clear that in two of the case studies, um, it's actually uh, most spoken about. So these are kind of paragraphs where trust came up in the two case studies, and that's Northern Frisia and Northern Hesse. 
which are the two case studies. So we've got North, Northern Frisia. Um, that's mainly rural, I mean, Northern German um, uh, region that's on the border to Denmark. And it's also the home to many of the, the initial wind pioneers in Germany. Uh, and there's, of course, coming along with that, a very high density of wind turbines out on the ground. Um, and that's quite a networked uh, region, um, quite so sort of socially dense, uh, and then lots of community wind projects uh, and not an awful lot of resistance against wind. And the other region uh, would be North, Northern Hesse. Uh, Northern Hesse has been more of a latecomer in terms of wind build out, so actual turbines on the ground. Um, but in the city of Kassel and the Hinterland, there's a lot of activity um, in this kind of general sustainability transition uh, activities. Um, because the region uh, set the target for renewable energy development, they also had to designate a few uh, forest areas for wind development. Uh, and that's been extremely controversial in the region. Um, so what we have there is a rather well-networked uh, community around renewable energy pro um, development. Uh, and there's also numerous community wind projects, but there's also considerable resistance, especially against those projects uh, in forests. So just uh, some very, very, very initial findings uh, from just a, a rough overview, a quantitative, uh, no, just counting, really, uh, codings. Um, just uh, what's quite obvious, what's different between the two areas is that um, in Northern Frisia, um, it tends to be that uh, trust, uh, they speak more positively, in more positive terms uh, about this, about issues, about, um, I think it was people, organizations and institutions that I have here. Uh, and um, in Northern Hesse, this is very often has more of a negative connotation. Um, quite similar is that um, gradual trust, so this trust that you can build up and then lose again or lose again, uh, is actually more spoken about in both regions, which seems interesting, um, but then you can quite say that because, I mean, for Northern Hesse, it seems like both aspects are similarly spoken about, so the difference is not as uh, pronounced here. And overall, it's very clear that um, it seems that there's probably a lot more detail to be found. So these are, um, uh, yeah, these are co uh, paragraphs uh, basically about uh, trust. Um, so there's probably more detail found uh, to be found in the Northern Hesse case study. So possibly it might end up being a single case study after all. Uh, as you can see, I haven't really decided. So to my shame, I must admit, um, yeah, this is kind of where I'm sitting at uh, and I'm having to deep further dig dig in further to then actually make those decisions. So just to give you a bit of a, a sense, um, I've brought along some quotes uh, and that maybe gives you an idea of um, in which ways this, the, the analysis could then go. Um, so one of the things, uh, just an example here, kind of just on the, on the general role of trust, yeah. Um, somebody said it costs, of, costs us a lot of trust that there's no cross-party consensus anymore on the energy transition. So this has kind of changed from the initial days. Um, and so what we see is that political agreement or disagreement actually affects trust in a strong way. Also, a uh, very typical thing, um, for most people, it is very difficult to, to distinguish who is actually neutral or non-biased. So then if the citizen initiatives uh, against wind from around the corner, who you might know from the football or the local pub, comes along, uh, that could seem even more trustworthy and you're just gonna remember that. So local connections uh, that have been made and all the social ties in small scale regions, they also affect trust in a very strong way. And another issue, uh, and that's the one where I was going to mention, I think that might be uh, similar or even more pronounced in the UK is uh, you can say, oh, you know, just go to the national politics, the, the lender politics, you will find lots of politicians who hang out in the cities and communicate with the city folk. But you will find few who actually find their ways to 
good villages and are actually accepted and respected data. There, that's another aspect of this. So politicians tend to very often have an urban perspective. This is, of course, a little bit better with the federal systems in Germany and also in Austria. Um, we sometimes even say that uh, the countryside in some areas is even over uh, overrepresented because it's very strong uh, traditionally. Um, but still, so there's this urban perspective that seems to dominate. Um, then in terms of against losing trust, it's really even more pronounced for wind energy. People have lost in the institutions, uh, lost trust in the institutions. So not just politicians who have to represent that, but also institutions such as science. Such actors are then simply construed as biased and therefore not even considered as part of an objective debate. So it'd be interesting how did this come about? So what's kind of, what has happened that people have lost this trust um, in this very region? But I, again, I think it's something that uh, can be, could be transferable to some cases. Uh, on this kind of different types of trust, the difference between initial trust and gradual trust, trust um, that's just this basic trust. When I visit the local shareholders, it's just on an eye level. We have this exchange. You talk about the financial issues. This is just given. You cannot say why this is. It's just always been like that. That's been a development growing from small to something bigger. Uh, and then similar, this just exists here and that is invaluable. That's basic trust that you just have for each other. Um, so it's almost like a local regional resource. So it's just something that is just there in that region. Uh, and it's sometimes rather difficult to find out where it actually comes from. Um, I had this in my dissertation that it uh, was kind of ended up, people ended up telling me it's in, in those northern German regions, very often it's to do with, uh, they had to uh, defend against the, the sea, of course, so they had to build dams and these were often uh, financed uh, and built in a kind of collaborative financing models. And, and that's one reason that people were already kind of connected to each other and, and that people kind of felt in terms of energy, that's a similar subject and they could just kind of transfer this, tr these trustful relationships uh, to this just different issue. And then in terms of graduate trust, um, just to manage to read that. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, so we could just promise that we didn't want to lose our money either. So we would always put as much money in as everyone else. It's a question of trust and confidence that people can see that these are not just empty promises, but we're intrinsically motivated. Another one is uh, having left the region for a while, this particular company managed to rebuild a relationship with the people here when you can say, you, you know what, we can build wind turbines together and that's to do with these particular individuals. So again, that's relationships and social ties that uh, affect uh, trust. And then another example um, of especially um, what it means for particular, particular individuals, um, so there's this community here that was the first one to engage as, a, as an energy village. And their main income came from wind energy. There was this broad consensus among the population. This is what we want. Because there were mayors who convinced the community and who convinced the local committees and who didn't let any old wind guy just mislead them. And then another case, uh, the two of them, this is two um, particular uh, wind experts, they built this expertise over the years. They worked so well that there were uh, economic successes too. They dealt with this trust, uh, which can be very fragile and brittle in a very responsible way. They created the base for this positive mood and the continuous wind build out. So it's basically individual people um, taking that role of uh, kind of representing this incoming technology for the population uh, in the territorial region. So what are my reflections on, on these very, very, very initial insights? Um, something that I've really noticed, uh, especially as I tell people about this, uh, is that in real life, uh, the concepts trust, acceptance and legitimacy, legitimacy is almost not really a real life concept, if we're honest, um, they kind of are actually mixed up and they're very often used interchangeably. So in some ways, especially the differentiating between acceptance or legitimacy or which one is which is actually somewhat academic debate. Um, trust as such is uh, quite clearly a reciprocal um, 
concept. So both uh, characteristics of the trust and the trustee are actually uh, influential for the outcome. Um, and then it seems to me that maybe gradual trust would be more interesting to investigate a bit further. So that kind of speaks for the single case study um, because, and, and that's kind of, that's likely to actually yield more material as well. So in terms of questions that maybe I want to also have for you a little bit, um, it seems that I think going forward, uh, an interdisciplinary perspective will still be helpful. So where where would it best be to look for um, further perspectives onto this uh, without uh, losing focus, of course. And then also, and I think very importantly, what parts of this could uh, practitioners and policy makers actually uh, want to see explored further. Um, and I mean, I, I suspect that this gradual trust and how you build and lose trust and how that affects uh, transition processes would be interesting, but then, um, yeah, I'm kind of putting this question out there. So the, what are the next steps for me? Um, of course, uh, I have to continue diving uh, into the existing literature on these issues and then um, develop a proper framework, uh, which is an illustration as I did today. Um, part of my job also is to, to define an aim. So really um, decide whether it should be a demonstration of the overall relevance of the concept or actually an investigation of the characteristics of those trusted, for example, or actually the dynamics or yeah, one of those issues. It will have to be in the end. Uh, and then obviously dig into the existing qualitative data. And then do the write-up, which uh, looks really brief on here, but is of course the biggest job. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. I think I've been roughly in time as far as I can see. I have removed your faces. There we are. Um, <laughs> uh, and thank you very much for, for being here and for showing this interest and for listening to me.